As many of you probably already know, if you've followed this channel long enough, I'm a big admirer of C.S. Lewis and even use some of his argumentation in my videos from time to time. And this in spite of the fact that even though his conversion to first theism and then Christianity came through his good Catholic friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, he himself never went all the way to Catholicism, instead embracing a form of uh, high church Anglicanism. Lewis was famous for trying to build bridges along the fault lines of Christian denominations by promoting what he called mere Christianity, or what was essential and mostly agreed upon uh, among all those different denominations. You could also call it creedal Christianity because it promotes the fundamentals of the ancient creeds, which again, most denominations agree on. This is probably also why Lewis wasn't in the habit of criticizing any particular church or denomination, but he is supposed to have compared the Catholic Church to something like an overwhelming jungle where people can get lost or distracted before they ever get to the fundamentals of, again, what he called mere Christianity. And in the course of my own conversion and warming up to the Catholic Church, I found it hard not to sympathize with that criticism because Catholic thought and beliefs are, are so substantial that it can be easy to miss the forest for the trees. For example, I've met Catholics who can tell you all about the apparitions of Medjugorje, but don't know what the phrase consubstantial with the Father means in the Nicene Creed. I've met Catholics who can tell you all about the life of St. Juan Diego, but they can't name the 12 apostles. So maybe Lewis has a point, but instead of describing it as a jungle, I might amend that comparison to be something more like a library, like a massive 2000 year old library. Because if we're talking about the church's intellectual tradition, her teachings and even her dogmas, you actually do have something like a library of content. But the challenge with a library is that it's easy to get distracted by the stuff you want to read rather than the stuff that you should read. But ironically, I think that Lewis's point can serve as an inadvertent point in favor of the Catholic Church's claim to being a contender for the church that Jesus established himself, because the fact of the church's vast collection of content points to something else, which is that she is very, very old, ancient, in fact. G.K. Chesterton is famous for pointing out that no other living institution has been thinking about thinking for as long as the Catholic Church, and as a result, it's no wonder she has accumulated so much material. It's a natural effect of having been around for so long, and it's something that no other Christian denomination, community, or affiliation can claim. Lewis's own Church of England has only been around for about 500 years or so, so it can't lay claim to nearly as much output. And even the other ancient Orthodox churches, um, they stopped adding new thought after the East-West Schism, and as a result, they've been in something like a holding pattern ever since. But given that this can be an a seemingly legitimate source of criticism and that the, it can produce risks where people are distracted and fixated on secondary or tertiary uh, considerations of the faith while neglecting the, the fundamental primary teachings, it's understandable why we would want to un avoid unnecessarily adding to that deposit of faith and knowledge. But it should urge us to learn about what it is that causes new material to be added to what seems like an unwieldy library. And there's a lot we could say about this, but I want to highlight just two things um, which make this a necessary part of the church's activity. The first is what's known as the development of doctrine, which many people mistakenly think means the evolution of church doctrines from one thing into another. And since they believe this is a legitimate approach to the church's tradition, they can promote that certain doctrines, especially ones that they don't like, change or evolve or develop into doctrines that they do like. What it actually means is that our understanding grows from something more primitive to something more refined. We elaborate on doctrines that have come down to us through the tradition. So they go from a basic explanation to something much more nuanced and detailed. The analogy I always like to use is something like a painting. If you've ever watched a professional artist create a painting, you'll, you'll see that they'll start with a process of what's known as blocking in, where they create primitive shapes and outlines of the various elements that they want to include, including colors, so that by the end of that phase, you'll get a pretty strong impression of what the painting is, but it could still benefit from more detail. The development of doctrine is like taking that basic blocky image and adding details so that it becomes clearer. What it does not do is change the painting from one thing into another. So you don't go from a, 
a painting of a primitive portrait into a detailed landscape. It goes from a primitive blocked in portrait to a more detailed portrait of the same person. As those details are being added, we're adding more information. So just like with the library, we're adding more content to account for those details. And as time goes on, you may discover that your 2000 year old library has grown enormously. And while that could be evidence of the church's age and vitality, it doesn't mean that we should be unnecessarily and recklessly adding details or content just for the sake of being able to make our own mark. If we have something necessary to say, then we should. And that brings us to the second reason we need to add new material, which is heresy. Heresy is what happens when someone who is a little overly eager insists on making their own contribution to the deposit of faith without first anchoring themselves in the existing tradition. They want to introduce something that's new and novel. And as time goes on the and the teachings of the church become more explicit, that becomes less necessary and a lot more difficult to do. But heresy is a slippery temptation that vain theologians are easily seduced by. And as heresy starts to spread, the church has an obligation to respond by examining the claims and then clarifying if they are heretical and what by contrast is the correct understanding. And this, this is the reason that the church has historically called councils and synods to address some controversy and then to provide clear dogmas and teachings by contrast. For example, the Council of Nicaea was called in response to the controversy and heresy of Arianism. And as a response, we got the, dogma, the dogmas and doctrines around the Trinity. Um, the Council of Trent was called in response to Protestant ideas that were spreading and causing confusion. This is an important pattern for us to appreciate and to be attentive to. The reason we have dogmas like the Trinity is because someone first taught some incorrect alternative that the church then had to correct and clarify. The church calls councils and composes dogmas when it's necessary to do so and not when it's not necessary. That's why councils and synods are described as being part of the extraordinary magisterium because it's so unusual. The church's ordinary normative disposition is not to be gathering bishops and theologians from around the world to draft new teachings. The church doesn't needlessly add to the library or to the painting. She speaks when necessary and when it isn't necessary, she lets the library speak for itself and invites us to embrace studying it. But what do we make of a church who wants to be synodal for the sake of being synodal? It's not like we have identified some controversy that needs to be addressed. We haven't. Yet we insist on having meetings and adding brush strokes to a 2000 year old painting without any good reason to do so. What do you think it says about a generation who has an expansive 2000 year old library of wisdom at, the, at our disposal, but instead of immersing ourselves in it, we'd rather ignore the content that exists and add our own instead. We are at best students of the tradition of our faith, and as a result, we should be devoting ourselves to studying it. You would have to be a master to consider adding something that hasn't already been addressed. But maybe we are. Maybe the current crop of shepherds, theologians, and laity are largely composed of masters of the faith and are desperately needed to contribute their voices. And if you think so, I would invite you to consider what evidence there is to support that claim. Because the church that we are currently curating is in a state of crisis. It's an institution in demographic collapse. It's a church that is in the habit of rebounding from one scandal to the next. And it is a church that is so consumed by its own affairs that it is incapable of executing its own fundamental mission of evangelization. Far from proclaiming the kingdom to a culture that is desperate for truth, goodness, and beauty, we can't even keep our own members from abandoning the pews at alarming rates. What about this state of affairs suggests that our top priority ought to be adding new brushstrokes to an existing masterpiece when we haven't given any indication that we are masters of this art. If we can inherit a vast, beautiful library of wisdom, and instead of devoting ourselves to learning from it, our first priority is to try to fill it up with our own opining, then maybe Lewis had a point. And I hope we aren't about to embrace a process that is going to prove him right. Thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you feel called to support this work, then consider joining the Reinforcements, which is my online community. There are multiple tiers, including free access for those who can't help financially, but still want to join. You can join up at www.brianholtworth.ca. 
Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company, whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face. Even if you don't join, they make amazing products. So check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations. So be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.